Yes, welcome. Being recorded, we're on air and it's time for uh, the Eden Knapp web webinar, which is about widening access to open education, uh, looking at the way forward and also focusing a little bit uh, quite or quite a lot on the recent uh, Erasmus Plus project Moonlight, which uh, both of us have been involved in. So my name is Alistair Creelman. I come from Linnaeus University in Sweden, uh, the southeast of Sweden in the corner. You can see on the map where I am. And uh, yeah, Tim. Thank you, Alistair. My name's uh, Timothy Reed. I'm uh, at UNED, the National Distance Learning University here, smack bang in the middle of in Spain, in Madrid. And um, as Alice has said, we, we work together on the Moonlight project and we're hoping that some of the uh, conclusions we, we got from this uh, project and also the large amounts of time we spent discussing these issues both with project members and other academics, colleagues and friends, we can, we can share with you today. Yeah, as usual in these webinars, uh, sadly we, we can't actually see or hear you at the moment. You're, you're uh, registered as participants, but uh, we want to hear by in the chat. We'll certainly give you plenty of opportunity to write your ideas. We have some polls for you, one in just a second. So we hope to get lots of interaction. So have your fingers on the keyboards ready to contribute. Uh, okay, this uh, we're looking at widening access to open education, but also a little bit of taking stock of where is open education today. I think really all of us who are assembled here, I have a suspicion we're all very familiar with open education. We probably all work with open education. But if you look around at uh, the, the higher education sphere, not everybody is involved. In fact, uh, enormous amounts of colleagues have, have very little idea that open education even exists or what the opportunities are. And we're sort of looking at sort of where do we, how do we get forward on this? Uh, how do we widen access? There are many examples of widening access to open education and uh, getting more people involved in higher education, but is it really getting through? Is the message being becoming mainstream? So, yeah, Tim? No, I was going to say that I think that's a, an interesting reflection because I've been going to the, for example, the ALT, the Association for Learning Technology in the UK, um, Open Education, the OER conferences for, for some years now. And every once in a while, this, this topic comes up, you know, we, we've been working with open education, but the impact seems to be a little limited. What can we do to, to increase that? And I think that now um, with, the, with the, some of the changes we've had, the political and sociological changes we've, we've been seeing, for example, with the, the refugee crisis and um, the changing population across Europe, then I think this question is even more uh, pertinent now than ever. And I think that uh, hopefully we can make some reflections on, upon that point as the, as the session goes on. Okay. So uh, I would like to move on to uh, a first bit of input from you. Uh, hold on a second. I will uh, move over to the main. Here we are. Here we are. Here's a poll for you. Get some ideas. Brainstorm. Uh, chat as much as possible. Uh, what are the key challenges for widening access to open education as you see it? Uh, just write in your comment and they will appear under the answers. So uh, just get started basically. I mean, there's a potentially almost limitless uh, list that can uh, can go in here, depending really on context. I mean, on our departments, on our institutions, our countries, our languages, lots that can actually go in the cook pot, cooking pot here. Absolutely. Bandwidth limitations and also device limitations. A lot of people don't have access to, to good computing devices. And even if they are able to download a lot of open content, can't really make the most of it. At the same time, there are, I mean, there's a lot of people working on this. I saw a wonderful application from uh, oh, around various countries around the world. I think it was in Uganda where they had a, a very nice um, they had a, a solar powered uh, server. Uh, you could load it with educational uh, resources 
from a central location and then take it out to schools in outlying areas. It was run on solar power and could thereby transmit that information to tablets and mobiles in the classroom. And so they had access to online learning, even if they were not online or on the electricity grid. And, uh, there are, I mean, there's work going on like that. Student participation, yes. That's a good one because quite often the most disadvantaged students, what they want is face-to-face uh, -face contact with their educators because that uh, gives them a lot of the well-needed support. So having to connect to online um, resources and activities isn't necessarily the desired output for them. Mm -hmm. Any, some more challenges? That's a good one as well. Aligning with institutional culture. I think that's the. Sometimes you see the importance of the of the bottom up initiatives being driven by teaching staff and the top down ones being supported by and funded by um, institutions and regional governments. Yes, we'll be touching on that before long. And it says the institutional leadership, government initiatives, uh, sort of part of a culture. Uh, need for student self-directedness, that's another problem. People don't know how to take advantage of open education. Uh, in many cases, they don't know, ex many of them, most people don't know it exists. Most people mm -hmm. don't know how to use it, even if they do find it. And therefore, it doesn't get used. Indeed, and what to and what to do with it? I think that's a, a key thing because if they are already students, then they quite often have got a curriculum and associated materials with that curriculum, and it's difficult for people just to pick up additional materials. They sometimes feel a bit concerned that they're going to get confused with extra material. Okay. And um, another issue there, I think, is. Um, is the thing that uh, even if you're not on, a, on some kind of formal course and you come across an educational resource which is useful and you can actually make a note of the fact you studied this on your curriculum, I mean, who's there to, to vouch for the fact you've got it? I often think sometimes that, that when people enter into the world of open education, it's recognition and certification, rather than if you like getting yourself a job with that, you can certainly get yourself an interview and that's the op your opportunity to show that you do actually know something okay, about what you're Okay, you're welcome about. to continue to comment in the chat, but uh, I would like to... Uh... I'd like to, uh, we move on with a little bit of input before we get you back on the, to ask you more questions. Uh, a bit of background, Tim, uh, we have what we experienced in the Moonlight Project, some conclusions, some thoughts, and keep the comments coming in the chat, please. Just your ideas, your questions, whatever you think. Okay, Tim. Sure, absolutely. Okay, let's let's talk about this then. Um, I don't want to get into too much detail about the Moonlight Project because you have the link there. It's now finished. It finished at the end of um, August, and all of our documentation, outputs, results are available on the on the website. So you can you can find about more what we were doing. But really, the objective of this uh, of this project was to apply. Um, open education, specifically MOOCs for disadvantaged people, typically refugees and migrants, and help them with um, social inclusion, entering into the higher education market and also into, into employment. And uh, we are focusing, focusing on, on uh, sort of skills you'd need to get uh, businesses going and also key for us were, were linguistic um, issues. So this is quite a narrow focus and I think we, we managed to do this quite quite well, but at the same time, as the project was finishing, we, we came to see the broader um, conclusions for um, what I call OERP, you know, Open Educational Resources and Practices for the world in general. I mean, we can think about the, um, the sustainable um, development goals for, for 2030, for example. And I think open education has a lot to, uh, to offer with, to those particular, um, to meeting those particular uh, goals. So, as part of this process, we've been fortunate enough to uh, to count on the generosity of colleagues and, and experts for lots of conversations, round table sessions, workshop um, events, and just general interviews. And from that, we've drawn what we've uh, set up as being the Hague Declaration, which essentially highlights these set of um, seven challenges, which we think are 
could be uh, game changers for moving open education forward into uh, the short term future. And this is what we're uh, we're going to sort of use this as a skeleton, if you like, for this uh, for the input here and as a as a background. I mean, I don't think we necessarily mean to imply that these are the only challenges, but that other other challenges that are easily identifiable, I think, can be subsumed by by um, by these. So let's just go through them now and give you, if you like, a, a bit of a taste of, um, of uh, our thoughts on them. I mean, we can start off by, by talking about the question of access to um, MOOCs and, and open education. And the um, irony here quite a lot of the time is that a lot of the people who can most benefit from open education are the ones who don't actually um, come across the sort of courses they want and aren't necessarily always able to participate um, in them. I mean, one of the things we did as part of this group was to reach out, in our case, to the refugee support groups, to um, different associations, charities who were working with this particular kind of um, people and actually get them involved in the project, which enabled us to actually come into contact with, your, with the refugees and, and migrants, and certainly the ones that were either in Spain or coming to Spain and, and looking to try and settle down and have a future here. And it was really quite uh, interesting in a way there, um, the, just the lack of idea that the, um, these people had about open education and what you could do with online teaching. For example, there was a, a very well-established um, a non-governmental organization in Madrid that um, teaches face-to-face uh, -face classes with refugees and migrants and they've been doing this for several years so it's an amazing service and they had no idea what um, online education could actually um, offer to their students so uh, we ended up doing a couple of language MOOCs as part of the courses we let them run them in a, in a blended learning fashion and it was actually quite uh, quite positive that's that's one of the the problems and you can say okay we can maybe get around this if you like by making by aggregating better the courses informing the different associations and trying to get the information out but the other side of the coin of course is that even if they know about the courses MOOCs um, are run um, typically on a, on a regular basis. They might be run twice, four times, eight times a year, but they're not open all the time. So if a, a particular uh, group of people or even an individual wants to enter a course, it may not be around at that particular t um, time. So what can we do about that? Well, we can actually try and make the access to the course as flexible as, um, as possible. Actually, I'll move on to, the, to, te to that point here. So. One thing we can do is try to have a particular course running as far as possible, as many times as possible. And the other thing is that when they're not being run, to actually leave them as open educational resources. Take a snapshot of the of the forums, for example, and the interactive activities, because um, it can be a little um, dangerous for the people who are participating in these um, courses or want to participate if they come across forums and there isn't anybody on the other end to actually uh, answer it can be a it can be a bit difficult because then other people come in and start answering their questions and it can be a little bit chaotic so we need to freeze the forums and the the chats and the activities but leave the resources online so it's very important in that end, in that sense to use open licenses for the content creative comments stuff like um approaches like that but make it available as possible and uh, this I think will fit on or fit in with something that Alistair might be saying later on when we look at the business models because the problem with this approach is that it's very nice to have open courses and everything's free but we all know all of us grown-ups in the room know that there's no such thing as free somebody somewhere is paying so if it's free for our users it's not necessarily free for us we have to pay the keep the service running the electricity we have to keep the networks open the people who are preparing the content who's going to be facilitating the courses so it's tricky so in a way if we are very very um uh, stringent about this and say no everything has to be open and free it can be a problem for our institutions and their and their business model so we need to uh, we need to be careful I mean there are ways around it with with um, with uh, services that can be value-added related but the the core part of the courses need to need to be um, you need to be open as say, far as possible to some here and you can uh, you, another then of course to um, yeah. leave the resources open and free but with some kind of uh, guidance for teachers and let other institutions use that material and form courses around it uh, applying it to the local situation um, that's a model that is being used by, by several operators and uh, seems quite successful. Give people the material and the chance to actually do something with it. Absolutely. I mean, that can work. I've got a colleague in, a, in another open university in Europe and they have 
a huge amount of content of, um, of resources and activities put online and they actually track what happens and it's done in such a way that the idea is that fellow colleagues download the courses, they use them, they adapt them, etc. and then they upload them again if you like to to improve and extend the the content and the, and the data is actually quite damning in that sense that lots of people download it presumably they use it but nobody actually uploads it again so that is um, is something that uh, is still still needs to be solved if it is in fact a, a reasonable um, possibility for progress in this, in this particular um, area Okay, another important issue here is that of, of uh, support for the people who are actually taking the uh, courses. I mean, I don't want to get into the whole issue of dropout because sometimes MOOCs in a way are crit heavily criticised because of the dropout rates, which can be as high as 90% on these courses. There are lots of counter arguments about this, saying like for a lot, of, a lot of the people who enter in MOOCs, they're not entering to do the whole course. They're just entering because they want to get some of the resources, have a look and come out. And I must admit, I've done, I've done a few MOOCs um, that way. I don't have the time to do the course but I'm very interested in the, in the topic so I'll just go up and cherry pick some of the other resources um, but what we need to appreciate um, with this is, is that if we're offering open education for students that are outside of our typical um, catchment area I mean when MOOCs were first being offered in um, in um, 2012, around then, then the majority of the people who are actually taking part of the uh, in these courses were actually um, people who already had degrees. They were European or North American students, and they were already educated and familiar with using online platforms. And culturally, quite used to doing what we're doing now. What are we doing? We're sharing. We're opening opening ourselves up to this uh, event that's being recorded without any uh, hesitation or, or preoccupations. But for people coming from a different area, from MENA, for example, from the Middle East or North of Africa, then they may not be quite so easy, so open to doing this, especially if they're, they're refugees, they've had to flee from a particular um, conflict situation at home, then they can be a little concerned about the way they actually participate online. So they need to be supported and uh, this can be done, it can be done implicitly in the way the course is prepared and also in the, the role we give to the facilitators and, and tutors on the, um, on the course to actually uh, um, interact with the people so that they feel safe and they feel they are able to, uh, to participate. I think this is fits in quite nicely with the comment that Alistair made just before the video was being recorded at this session for the participants. Of course, if there's anybody here who doesn't want to uh, leave personal data in their, in their recording, then they can just log back in with, a, with an imaginary name and that way it, uh, it solves the problem. So, if you like, the other side of the of the argument here is it's not just a question of, of supporting, it's a question of preparing the courses a priori to be inclusive, you know, designing and developing the MOOCs for that. And there are lots of different um, important issues that need to be uh, addressed for this to, to work. And it does work because, for example, the two language MOOCs we, we ran inside the Moonlight project, rather than having a 10% um, uh, finishing rate, we had over 30% of the people finishing the courses and they really were connecting and participating well on, online. So I mean, if you want to read this, and I don't have time to go into all the details now, then I, I strongly suggest you have a look at some of the reports we've written on the, uh, the project uh, website. But if I could only, I'd only identify one element which I thought was really key to this process is to involve your public in the design, development and deployment of the courses, which we were lucky enough to do. Um, thanks to our stakeholders, our refugee support groups and the refugees themselves, we were able to listen to them and say, OK, you know, within the, the limit of the project, what kind of courses would you like? How would you like these courses to be structured and what kind of activities would you like to be undertaken there? And then by starting from there, we were able to develop the, the materials with them and actually test the learning scenarios with uh, small groups and um, I mean it just worked very very well it made it was such a, uh, a character building and a positive exercise for everybody involved and um, it really enabled us to actually scaffold the whole process and uh, and uh, enabled them to actually connect with the uh, with the tool I mean one thing I think I should mention as well is that there are a whole set of, uh, of, of limitations of whatever technology you're, you're going to be uh, using. Every MOOC platform has its limitations. I mean, sometimes we're lucky in the sense that our institution has its own platform or has an agreement with a big MOOC platform, which are very powerful and have a lot of functionality. Other times we don't have that, but you don't necessarily have to have a MOOC platform to run 
these open educational courses, and it's really it's really possible to to do this um, using the the open tools that are actually uh, online. If we're not necessarily concerned with um, with the branding issues, if we're happy to have the uh, the platforms actually uh, um, there. So I think that's really enough for me now. And as I say, the um, all the information underlying these points are on the, the project website and you can in fact um, go and have a look at this in, in, in more detail um, if you want to. So let me just summarize. So what I said to start with in the four points I was covering is that um, the important characteristics is to improve the access to the courses in a sense of visibility and also um, that they are available in more more time. Try to keep them open and free as much as possible and um, the idea of designing for inclusion designing for your audience and then the need to actually provide the support in the uh, the MOOCs as they run okay so I think what we can do now is if we can go back to the chat and I can just shut up for a minute here and that will give you the opportunity to agree disagree share some reflections or, or personal experiences and um, that will give Alistair and myself the, the opportunity to um, to participate in this as well. Okay, we're looking for some uh, comments in the chat, please. Uh, have you got something to offer on these points? What do you think about these points? Uh, I have actually decided to open mics, and if you have a good headset installed and you have a, have the opportunity, you can raise your hand. There's a button up there for raising your hand, and you are welcome to speak. Top left. Yep. You can actually, you, I think it's quite all Top right left. for you to speak, if that is easier. But please raise your hand first and we'll invite you to speak. Let's wait while you type. <clears throat> I can see people are typing here. Yes, uh, I think, in fact, the number was closer to 32%, and the uh, the satisfaction questionnaires were were very, very, very positive. In fact, we ran two language MOOCs, both A1, A2, and um, the first one had somewhere in the region of 2,500 people connected, of which 30% uh, finished. Then we, we ran the second part of the course, slightly more advanced, and we had about uh, 1,300. And once again, the, the, the finishing uh, rates were, were pretty uh, much the same. Yeah, I, I think they, they were, um, were quite successful. I mean, what people actually really wanted was, um, if you like, you know, the sub-language of Spanish in your typical situations that they'd find themselves if they came to Spain. So, for example, going to the town hall, the first thing you need to actually is to register, get your, your permission documents for, for being here. And um, what you actually have to to get, then if you like going to the chemist shop, going to the the, the doctor, which of course can sometimes be a, a problem. If you can imagine it, if you've got uh, a lady with her child who's ill from a, a Middle Eastern background and has to go along and see a male doctor, then that can be a, a little stressful, shall we say. So um, um, predefined time slots. I mean, both language MOOCs lasted six weeks. But like any MOOCs, we had a suggested timing. You have the first week, which is, if you like, is just getting to know the platform, getting to know the content, and the sixth week, which is, if you like, the catch-up week and doing all the activities you haven't done. And then we had one topic a week, and um, that way it gave us enabled us to actually uh, get some uh, structure. Okay, um, Antonella, the, the impact from a, a social in inclusion uh, point of view. Um, one of the things we were very careful to do with this was to actually um, train our facilitators and also um, content developers so that the language was always inclusive by, by nature. And that rather than, if you like, talking about um, us and you, we were talking about we the entire time and trying to move people into into feeling safe and secure with them and, and actually trying to uh, get them to feel part of the same, if you like, wider social group that we were on the on the course. And we actually did a, we got an article um, coming out about the, the use of inclusive language in MOOCs. And um, I think that was actually quite important. Um, 
the activities were limited in a way by the the platform because um, at our institution we use open edX so you know the sorts of tools you you've got there I mean we combined closed test with open um, report essay writing that's corrected if you like in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, way so if you like you write your report you submit it and then you you correct three other reports and that way when you get the feedback you get the feedback from the uh, from the three people. The other thing we tried to do as well was to um, correct people's language in the in the forum. I mean, the course was a Spanish uh, course, but it was A1, A2. You know, using the the common European framework of um, of, of reference for languages. So you really can't expect too much in the way of interaction in the in the target language. So we also allowed them to use their own. Um, uh, languages people were speaking in Arabic and in and in French, and we were lucky enough to have facilitators who could who could use those languages and um, and basically uh, uh, help them. So the the open tools for the MOOC. I mean, you've got two choices as far as I can see. You can use the tools which the platform actually uh, provides. Which the advantage there is you can you got the analytics about their how they're working. You can capture the results. When you grade them, you can use them toward the final grade of the course, or you can just um, take people out and get them to use other tools, other kinds of uh, resources that are actually uh, online. I mean, we had a Facebook group associated with the, the MOOCs, for example, and once we got people in that kind of environment, then, um, as I say, the interchange of, of uh, of information between us was a lot more open but but then once again it's a bit of a trust because you're crossing a line in a way because when they register for the course they can use any any name they want we're not controlling them but of course when you connect back to a social network and they're already on that social network then um, you have to be a bit careful because typically these are people's real profiles and um, unless they're they've got the security carefully set up on on Facebook it's very easy just a couple of clicks to jump across to their timeline see their friends see their family Etc. So um, I think that's things that uh, have to be uh, have to be done. Another key issue at the time of, of choosing tools is thinking about where these people are going to be and what kind of devices they're going to be uh, using. I mean, the majority of our students were using their mobile um, phones, and most of them were already somewhere in Europe and had access to to reasonable bandwidth. So we were careful when we when we built the uh, the videos that they were short they were low resolution so it wasn't difficult for them to uh, to download but we also had transcriptions we had transcriptions in Spanish and then we had the transcriptions in their in their own languages to uh, to actually enable them to I mean you know download the content to their phone then they could actually use it as much as they wanted to yep. and then unfortunately for the activities they had to actually connect back Alistair yeah Don's question about providing support and so on I think uh, I mean one of the models uh, Chiron has been very successful as I understand with this is uh, is getting sort of local support centers uh, workers in sort of refugee support centers it can be libraries it can be community centers but getting them on board and having communication with them providing them with a, maybe a little bit of a basic handbook or something so that they can gather learners locally and talk to them and guide them through it because i don't think that uh, these sort of groups are just going to pick up use their mobile and get onto a mooc just like that they need to they need to get that inspiration and support locally and so local support is extremely important but that's relying on voluntary workers doing it. You know, it's it's relying on a sort of very informal network. And uh, that's an, an, ex, an excellent um, uh, question or comment, uh, Don, and also what what Alistair said. In our case, what we did, I mean, obviously, if you've got three thousand students there, they're not all active online at the same time in the forums, and and um, the the participation is 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 a lot uh, a lot smaller than that but what we did was to um, really really try and make the MOOCs a blended learning activity so if you like a lot of the students the people who actually came in contact with the MOOCs they came in contact because of the refugee support groups who are actually pushing information out saying you know these people are doing this project it's well worth trying it you know have a go if you've got any problems get back to us and then um, as I said there, there was lots of documentation there was textual and video documentation about the platform Form about how this could um, the interaction could be handled, and for the the facilitators, we actually provide the, provided them we scaffolded their their interactions with the students and um, and uh, you know tried to actually get them to you know 
participate in, in this particularly positive way. And the other thing which is which is delicate from a, a, a language teaching perspective is when you've got someone who's a you know a false starter and they're making lots and lots of mistakes, you have to be careful not to correct too much because then if you suddenly find that everything you say is, is just completely rewritten by the person who's working with you, you just shut up and don't say anything. So it's a question of if you like picking one little mistake and correcting it constantly and trying to get them to come back with you using that same particular um, expression and, and getting it to, to work. But the, I mean, the whole thing, the whole key uh, issue here was um, getting them in from the very beginning. This wasn't, a, a, I mean, look, we're the smart academics in our ivory towers. Look, this is what you need. No, 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 no. We had them in at the beginning. We told them about the project, you know, free tea and biscuits. Then we had the sessions about what open education is, what MOOCs are, etc. And then we all sat around the, the round table and we thought about how we could do that. And they were participating as well as as well as they they did, and Frank, the the question about the the certificate, we gave a free one ECTS um, certificate to everybody who did that. We didn't do digital badges, but it was um, a standard uh, UNED one ECTS, which um, they get as a PDF. It uh, on the front, it gets the course title, details about it, the name, the the fact that it's it's worth um, one ECTS at UNED if you like, and on the back of the certificate, you had a full breakdown of everything they've done in the course. Yep. We we'll just uh, we can we can move on a bit, uh, Tim. You're welcome to continue sort of answering the questions in the chat while Sorry. I'm talking. Uh, I mean, it's uh, I think it's a very important uh, that the moving on to the next uh, part here. That it's about sort of recognition and MOOC certification and so on. Um, the the point that uh, Ferenc was making there about badges and so on. Badges can be very nice and so on, but it, what a lot of the in terms of social inclusion, what they really want are real credentials and giving them one ECTS, although it is merely symbolic, it is a, it is a credential that is accepted. And uh, in this sort of situation, that is vital for the people taking these courses. They want to get a foothold in the new society and, uh, you know, a credit here and there can make a big difference. It shows that they're, they're on track. We need more recognition of prior learning. We need uh, recognition of MOOCs, uh, whatever we want to define them as, or open education in general. <clears throat> uh, basically, the, with, I mean, recognition of prior learning needs to be strengthened. I mean, we can see that around Europe. And there's a lot of initiatives at the moment looking at how to recognize non-formal learning, how to recognize open education, uh, how to make MOOCs more credible in terms of getting ECT, instead of getting, getting real credits for, for them, and how to make that, uh, how to be able to do that in a, a safe way and a trustworthy way so that they are credible credentials at the end. There are many projects at the moment in Europe doing this. I mean, we have the Europass, we have the EU Skills Profile, the European Qualifications Framework. There's been other projects like OE Pass and Micro HE. I could give a long list of projects and initiatives over the last few years that are doing extremely interesting work on how we can credentialize this sort of amoebic or very difficult to hard to define learning that's going on in workplaces in our free time through open educational resources, through open courses, and through general work experience. Um, the trouble is that uh, MOOCs are recognized very sporadically. Some universities are working with providing credentials for MOOCs. Many universities won't accept them at all. Many will deny that they are valid for anything. Many countries in the world, uh, there's no formal recognition of e-learning at all. Uh, any sort of online learning is looked upon with suspicion. Uh, Refugees are unable to get scholarships or financial support often to get on to, into higher education. And really we wondered, uh, you know, can we get an internationally accepted recognition framework for MOOCs? Um, would that be possible? Can we get some kind of overarching principle that everyone can sign up to? Uh, Many questions here, but no real answers, except that this is an urgent, uh, this is something that is quite urgent, both in Europe and around the world. And there is work in progress and some very admirable work. Yeah, I could just uh, add, we've just started a, a new um, Erasmus Plus project, 
running to 2022 exactly on that particular issue, ECOE, which is really trying to look at a system for making the process of, of mutual recognition of uh, micro credentials a lot more agile because it really is a uh, a, a problem, you know, somebody from Lithuania decides they want to do one of our Spanish language MOOCs, we give them an ECTS, but then when they get back to their uh, um, university, the, the credit's not actually recognized for anything. I mean, all most Bologna degrees have this idea of you, you, your free credits, but then actually getting somebody else's uh, credits actually recognized is, is difficult. You know, I always think it's a bit like the old saying, it's easier to use an academic's toothbrush than his, uh, his technology or his, uh, or his certificates. Yep, exactly. Uh, Ferenc, uh, you're welcome to post the links to micro HE and OE pass for those who are interested, because in the chat, that's it's very good to have links and the people watching this recording can also click on them and investigate these two projects. We need open educational policies at national and international levels. Uh, as many of you know, I mean, there are plenty of top level initiatives, uh, international initiatives from the European Commission, from UNESCO, from OECD, all of whom have uh, raised the importance of, of open educational uh, resources and practice recognition of open educational uh, initiatives. There's a lot of excellent top level uh, documentation and recommendations and international conferences regularly come out with uh, position papers, recommendations and declarations. So there are many, many very, very good and very practical suggestions out there. The trouble is that it's a bit of a patchwork approach at national level. Some countries are listening to this and doing something about it and others are not and uh, it varies very much from one to the other. Open education is far from mainstream. As I said in the previous one, it's still questioned by many people. And it seems in a way that if you look at the situation today, there's a lot of top down initiatives from the very top, from a sort of international level. Uh, there's a lot of initiatives from the bottom up, but somewhere in the middle, there things seem to go missing. I'm not sure how you see it in your country, but I think uh, that's a very common problem. And so we have lots of puzzle. We have lots of the jigsaw puzzle has lots of pieces, but we're only just putting it together. And we still have quite a long way to go to get some kind of policy, sort of consistent policies at both these levels and that it actually also gets down to institutional level. I think you're you're completely right there. I mean, the the most activity is is at the top of the bottom of the sandwich, if you like. And um, I think until we get uh, clear leadership at political level, if you like, a European level, which then has um, implications for national governments, and they therefore, when they're when they're actually defining their educational laws, are actually making it part of the in the same way they they specify what has to be on a particular syllabus for a particular kind of degree, then they can also actually include these sorts of uh, appreciations about um, open education and what we can actually do with them because you can tell sometimes by if you look at you know with how how the wind blows I mean, if you're looking at uh, the european funding i mean what the europe is funding is giving you an idea of what's important for them and um i think the idea if you like that um you know the new migration into europe the the initial skills that the um the refugees and migrants would need are linguistic skills i think that was the case a few years ago and it's not the case now they realize that these sorts of questions are, are pretty much being being uh, solved. So now we're moving on to the, the next level, if you like, and um, I've got another project about um, citizenship at uh, European level as well. And these are the sorts of skills we want to get, new democracy, how to involve people in the, the decision-making uh, process. It's all part of social inclusion to make you feel part of, a, of the country where you actually are. And as part of this, if you like, we've got the real free movement between European countries, but we don't have that with our educational um, qualifications. I mean, I can remember in my case, I mean, 30 years ago when I moved from the UK to Spain, I already had a degree, I already had a doctorate, but I wanted to work in a Spanish university. And it was uh, very difficult for me to get uh, these qualifications, if you like, officially recognized by um, the Spanish education authorities, so I could actually teach in the university. I mean, it took me six months of, of painstaking paperwork and paying lawyers and, and all sorts of uh, issues to do it, but I managed it. And that was between two European countries. I mean, if I'm coming here from somewhere from the Middle East, I mean, and I have limited uh, financial resources, I mean, that would just be mission impossible. So that's something we need to think about how to, how to address, I think. 
Indeed. Uh, finally, in this uh, the sort of new funding business models, um, in a way, we're, we've, we've been looking at MOOCs a lot, but uh, what is a MOOC anyway? Where is it go? What, what actually is it anymore? Uh, it's morphed into many, many different branches. There are still very many courses that are genuinely open online. Uh, they can be massive and, and they are, they are open. They're, they're, they're free to copy. They're free to use. Um, genuinely open courses still exist. There are still quite a lot of them. On the other hand, many of the top the commercial platforms are sort of monetizing everything. So we see more and more monetization of these courses. And in fact, the term MOOC is not being used so much by many of these actors. Um, we're talking about they talk about online courses that you pay money for. You may be able to to look at the material for free, but you certainly can't participate for free anymore. You certainly can't get any credentials for free. You can't get any support for free. So that more and more layers are being built on this model. So we have to really, let's look more at sort of open education or how we define that than actually talking about MOOCs so much. Uh, maybe the term has, has, has run its course and it's time to look at new, model, new, new terms for this, preferably not uh, complicated acronyms. Uh, there are, I mean, there's a lot of collaboration going on. A lot of uh, universities, especially in Europe, are now running their own MOOC platforms or regional MOOC platforms, which are done on a very sort of open and sharing, uh, an open and sharing culture. They're taking the risks together. They're not running it for commercial gain. And there's, there is a lot of collaboration and interesting projects, but they don't sort of, they don't, they're not very visible very often unless you know where to look. Uh, we need incentives for universities to engage more in widening access to higher education and using open education to do that and sharing resources. There still isn't that top down incentive uh, for universities to get involved if they don't want to. Could we have a European MOOC portal? Is it necessary? You can write your views in the chat or in a minute. Uh, we're going to open up for some more uh, ideas from you. Uh, there are lots of MOOC portals, but no one co portal covers everything. We have Class Central, but it generally looks at the commercial uh, MOOC platforms rather than those the more innovative uh, open courses that are a little bit under the radar. The commercial platforms are the most visible, basically, and that's where that's what most people refer to when they're talking about this phenomenon. So. Really, if we come to sort of find some conclusions on this. Uh, Tim? Well, I think one of the things uh, I mentioned in the in in the chat, if you like, uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, but I think it's it's, it's quite true that not all ECTS are are equal. I mean, when we when we started on the Bologna process, and the idea of actually, um, you know targeting our courses and our teaching at ECTS, which is very important, if you like, as a kind of currency for open education in the same way as it is. I mean, all it really has achieved, in my humble opinion, is that we are using the same uh, language to talk to each other, not that we actually understand what each other is um, is saying. It's actually difficult. If, I, I like to think that, if you like, the, the credits we give on these courses sometimes are like banknotes. I mean, if you're walking around with, with euros, dollars, and and uh, England, UK pounds sterling in your in your wallet, then you've got a good chance of being able to go just about everywhere and spend it. But if you come from some smaller countries with their currency, then that's not guaranteed. So we do really need to solve this 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 question of recognition and the the added value of, of certification. And there are a lot of um, initiatives going on. You've you've talked about them, and this is something that needs to happen uh, um, more so in the future. And and the the European Commission are funding these. Uh, these sorts of projects, and uh, I think that will be uh, um, will be we'll see more of this in the in the future. And then it's also the the practical value of the course because we're talking about this. If you like, it's not just about people doing a course on basic Spanish so they can get up to a, a B1, B2 level to be able to study in a foreign university. I mean, what about practical and more applied skills? In which case, what we need is enough to be able to start working in the job market. In which case, once you're a potential employer is actually seen that you're able to do uh, the job you said you could do, then you got you'll have he or she will have more trust in you, and uh, and things will advance from there. Okay, uh, we're beginning 
we're heading towards the end. Uh, we've got a question below. Uh, let's see if we can get some answers. Uh, of course, you can write in the chat. Keep, keep chatting away, please. The more you contribute, the better it gets. Uh, but there's a question down here. And uh, let's see if there's a, why is open education not more widely used or appreciated? Or maybe we, do you feel we've already answered that? Or have you got some clues there? Any other, why is it not really getting through? The idea is wonderful. Um, that we all, sh education is there to be shared. Knowledge can be shared. Uh, by sharing with each other, we can, our knowledge can grow. We can exchange experience. Um, it seems like a no brainer. Somehow there are things that stop us. Credibility and credentialing. Yep. That I think is right. But um, I mean, it depends on which institution is actually uh, is certifying the activities that are that are going along. And uh, it's interesting because I, when MOOCs first were, were getting hot in uh, the beginning, then there were some conferences on MOOC, and I remember going along with with sort of talks about, but how can we actually really know it's the student who's doing uh, the work on the course and it's not their smart cousin who's already qualified, etc. And uh, there were some very deep and meaningful reflections and, and the people started to work on some really sophisticated technology like keyboard recognition, cameras, etc, etc. Or what, in fact, what we did at UNED, which was quite a pragmatic solution, at least for the people in Spain, was to let the students, if they wanted to, go along to one of our regional study centers and do the final test there, and they'd have to have their identi identity document over the ta over on the table next to them, and we could see who was doing it. That's one way. But I think as time has gone on, we've we've kind of moved away from these anxieties because it's not typically about one big killer test that somebody has to do. If you have a, a well-structured MOOC with um, you know, 10, 20 activities at the end of the course, I mean, you might be able to get your smart cousin to come in and do the first couple, but if you want he or her to come in to do uh, 20 of them, he's going to tell you to forget it, basically, because he's got better things to do with their, with their life. But I think um, this, this credibility issue will uh, will continue, And but in the same way as um, it is for standard degrees and and master's qualifications at the moment. Dale has mentioned P P L A R. Would we doubt the smart cousins? I'm not sure what P L A R means. Um, Dale will elaborate, I think, because he's typing yeah. at the moment. Um, the mind boggles. I think. Uh, Please leave a reward. <laughs> Got no idea. Final learning assessment <laughs> recognition. Ah, oh, prior learning assessment. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we also have these sort of remote proctoring uh, solutions. Of course, they're commercial, but I mean, they could be run by the by universities in collaboration. But uh, being able to monitor, as you said, with uh, using remote ca with cameras, with uh, sensor to to track uh, keyboard patterns and so on, and having a camera monitoring the person all the time and locking down the computer to only allow the the test to, to be run there are there are various technical technical ways to make sure that really the person who's doing it is the person they say they are and to be able to show your id card or password right in front of the camera um but um i think this is a bit of a, a um a dead end i think we're not we're not going to get very far with that kind of argument i still think that the value really is that it what uh, uh, an open educational certificate gives you it opens the door towards something else so for example let's imagine i've done some kind of introductory physics mooc and then i start doing a degree in physics i mean i'm not going to get very far on that course I'm down, i doubt very much i'd even finish the first semester my exams if i've had somebody else doing those uh, the course for me it's, it's really about learning for uh, capacitation and being able to uh, do things in a, in a better way and um, but, I mean, something we, we, we haven't mentioned here, which is also um, important, if you like, are that uh, sometimes there's, there's, if you like, hidden political agendas that, uh, that are not actually obvious. And, and uh, sometimes it seems, yeah, but why aren't people using open education? Well, because uh, there's a lot of people who make a, an awful lot of money by selling uh, um, content, selling their books, giving talks, providing, uh, providing teaching, if you like. And um, it's something that... Uh, well, I don't know if it's necessarily a completely bad uh, thing at the end of the day. I mean, everybody needs to be able to pay their mortgage and uh, feed their family. So um, 
But it's just things we need to take into into account. I mean, I think Alistair was completely right when he was talking about the sandwich, if you like, and uh, we don't really want to be squeezing the, the bread. We want to be putting more in the filling, trying to get the institutions to actually participate more in this in these issues and there's a comment here below on the sort of if we were talking about developing world uh, yeah a very different range of complexities i mean yeah we've got to talk about basic uh, access at all as we said access to technology access to quality education it's very complex as i said there are there are some excellent schemes going on in many developing countries using uh, as i said so solar powered servers and using um you know, low low tech solutions providing sort of bite sized learning on on mobiles, for example, which are much easier for people to acquire than anything else, and they're quite widespread. And uh, yes, that getting getting access when you don't have electricity, when you don't have internet, that is that's no no amount of open education is going to help you. But there are there are openings here. Things are beginning to happen. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And um, the certainly the refugees I've spoken to who are, who have either been living in camps or have come out of the camps. I mean, it's not like us. I mean, we're at the moment we're sat in reasonably warm, quiet rooms, and we have the luxury of being able to think and and and, uh, and participate. And uh, that's quite often not the case. If you've got maybe four families sharing a tent, I mean, the, the noise and the background din and the difficulties of, uh, apart from the, the bandwidth limitations, I mean, that's the, the least of their worries in a way. It's just, it's just very, very difficult, apart from the psychological issues, because you don't just typically hop on the bus and, and move from one country to another quite happily and, and relocate. They've been through some pretty traumatic experiences. Even people who've migrated and haven't had to go through those sorts of circumstances can typically feel very alienated and they're not necessarily psychologically in the best place to be uh, worrying about um, education. And it's, it's a question of trust and stuff. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be, be trying and a lot of progress has been made and a lot of people who are, if you like, some of the people that are moving into Spain and stuff, they're studying on our courses and we know that they're better able to, to integrate when they actually uh, get there. And um, I think just a final comment about this, because it's not directly related to the, the project, but it's also interesting to, to think about the, the, the mindset of the people who, if you like, refugees that are moving over, because they quite often don't see themselves as moving, if you like, into Spain for the rest of their life. They just think they're going to be here there for a few years till the situation in their own country gets better and they want to go home. And, uh, you know, I mean, I've spoken to Syrian refugees who are still believing this. And you say, well, yeah, but have you actually seen what uh, what Syria actually looks like in the, at the moment? Do you think in 10 years' time you're going to be able to go back? And, um, I mean, we all hang on to hope. And I think sometimes the sooner people realize that they need to you know, adapt, adopt, and improve, um, the better True, it can but, be for uh, them. All the, all, the, all the people I know from around there, I mean, they, they're making a good show of it, but uh, they really are homesick. Uh, the trouble is you're homesick for a country that doesn't exist anymore. In the in the way you remember it. Uh, anyway, we need to uh, begin to wrap up things here. Uh, please keep uh, writing in the chat. You're welcome to do that. I would also like to tell you that if you can, if you see below on the little presentation there, you can click on these links. There is the link to the Moonlight Project where all the outputs are available. There are lots of reports available. There's a lot of stuff there if you're interested in learning more. We even have the Facebook group is still going, MOOCs for Social Inclusion and Employability, and will continue as long as there's activity there. Uh, however, I'd like to point you in the direction of other things because later this evening we have an Eden chat and uh, that's sort of part of the process here a, a chance to discuss these issues in more detail uh, it's fast and furious uh, chatting via Twitter is you know, a bit of a challenge for some people uh, but I find it I find it very stimulating you need a critical mass so if any of you are on Twitter get on there at uh, around at six o'clock this evening a little bit before and search the hashtag Eden chat and that will get a column up so you can see everything that has the hashtag I'll be asking questions and you answer them or contribute and every tweet you use you use the hashtag Eden chat because if you don't use the hashtag everything every time we won't see what you're saying so the hashtag is the key for everything there so please uh, come there and see what happens so also uh, 
Coming Eden events, uh, I noticed that the Secretariat has beaten me to it. There is a, there is a, the next webinar, the next NAP webinar uh, is the inclusion of learners with digital technology, uh, hosted by Elspeth Sorensen from Aalborg University, not far from here. 16th of October, same time, and uh, you can register already uh, by clicking the link in the chat. In the uh, the link in the, the slide here, you can go to other Eden Online events, and I'd like to also point you in the direction of European Distance Learning Week. There will be a lot of interesting webinars and events, online events that Eden are arranging, and also a lot of other organizations, uh, and you'll get the details on the Eden website. If you want the presentation file that we have used at the bottom of the page here, you can download the slideshow. And that really brings us to the end of this webinar. Uh, you are going to get badges for your participation. So uh, as long as you have registered for this webinar, you are on our radar and uh, the Secretariat will be sending you a digital badge very soon. Any final words from Tim about, uh, about this? Are we any thoughts to close with? I... I'd just like to thank everybody who's been here, especially the people who have participated in the, in the chat. And um, do keep on the wavelength, if you like. As I said, I've got two, two projects coming starting now, 2019. One about the citizenship in, um, in the European space. Another one about the, uh, this issue of uh, certification and, and making the recognition issues a whole lot more agile. And I think there will be a lot of overlap with the stuff we've done in, in Moonlack. And, and, um, You've got our contact details on the uh, on the website, and we'd love to hear from you and carry on talking about this and meeting you maybe at other events in the future. Yep. I'm just uh, my Twitter address is at the bottom. Uh, I'm I'll be behind the most of the Twitter stuff this evening.